Is the screen visible? Yeah, hello. Yes, so the screen is visible. Right, so guys, let us start with the class now. Okay. Uh, the first of the case for the day is on very close range. So, as I have said, that this is a postgraduate surgical exit examination post camp. Definitely will not be delving on with each and every topic in details. So let us talk about uh, the first case discussion is on varicose veins. And when we start with the varicose veins, a few things that are very, very essential and always important for a DNB or an MS examination starts with understanding a few gross ideas and concepts. Number one is that, that the veins in the deep extremity. Just give me a second, please. I opened the wrong presentation. Right. Okay, guys. So now, uh, now the important uh, to start the story. In the anatomy or the background anatomy in the system about varicose veins always starts by you understanding that that the systems of veins, the lower extremity, contains a deep vein and this superficial vein. Now, the deep and the superficial system of veins are called because their location is based on relation with the deep fascia. So this is the deep fascia, which is in relation with these structures. Now, that connects something, a something called as a perforator vein. So this is something that is called as a perforator vein, which is a connection. Now, whenever you understand that, that means the superficial vein is the above the fascia, and in the lower limb, there are two systems of superficial vein. One, something on the medial aspect called as the great saphenous vein. Now, the word saphenous means straight or superficial. Some Roman words will say superficial, some of them will say straight on Arabic. But important things are that the great superficial vein, which is a subcutaneous tissue, it has its tributaries which are in, in again the same plane. That means the tributaries of the great saphenous and the short saphenous veins are in this area. Okay. And then these are the tributaries. And then these tributaries have various names according to the CAP. The names have been numbered now. And what is important is, say for example, this is called as an anterior leg vein. And this is called as a posterior medial tributary of the leg or the posterior medial leg vein, also called as a vein of Leonardo. Whereas when you go to the thigh, you get a anterolateral vein, which is also called as an accessory saphenous vein. Whereas on the posterior medial aspect, we have an important vein for exams called as the vein of Giacomani, which is known to communicate between the great saphenous vein and the short saphenous vein. That means the Giacomani vein will communicate with the short saphenous vein. 
So the next time you have a patient with a short saphenous vein varicosity, remember, please do not forget to check the vein of Giacomani. Remember, all of them are superficial system. They are above the fascia. The deep system is known to take the blood to the heart. And while doing so, see the mechanism at which it does. Now the heart pumps the blood. The blood returns to the heart, usually by way of a squeeze of the calf muscles. Now, so this is called as the soleal pump. And as you can see in the picture, the soleal pump is responsible for squeezing the blood to the heart. Now, when there is a soleal pump which is squeezing the blood to the heart, as you can see in the picture, the blood is going to the heart. Now, the more important points to understand and remember is that that there are valves in the system which are going to prevent the backflow of the blood. So that means the whole system, if you now try to superimpose the picture with a perforator and the superficial vein, yes, so this is the superficial vein in concern, as you can see in the picture, this is the superficial vein. And what is connecting the superficial vein is something called the perforator. Now, if you have understood up till this part of the anatomy, then understand that, that why should a very close vein form at all? Now, understanding this is not that difficult. Remember that whenever you think about a very close vein, why should it form at all? Either it will form due to a block in the vein which will be due to a deep vein thrombosis. And the deep vein thrombosis is going to produce a defect in the valve. And the defect in the valve is going to be reflected as an increased venous pressure in the end of the vein. That means when this is coming down like this, if I now erase this part, just give me a second, guys. Yes, right. Now, so if I erase this arrow and... Uh, making you understand this thing simply, this is the valvular system in concern. And if this is the valvular system in concern, as you can see in this, is when there is a blood clot that is going to get formed in the whole system. Say, for example, this is the whole system that forms a blood clot. Now, in the midst of this blood clot, what is going to happen is there is a recanalization. Now, when there is a recanalization, as you have just seen, the valves are damaged. Now, so when the valves are damaged, the vector of the blood is coming down, which then stretches this pair of valves. And again, the back pressure then has to be reflected back in the perforated vein, which is going to get reflected into a vein called as the superficial vein. So if I ask you now, what is exactly a varicose vein? Remember that the main point in a varicose vein is that, that the blood in a varicose vein is going to go in a reverse direction. So this is what is important. And now, so everyone tells about that, sir, a varicose vein is a dilated, tortuous, elongated vein. Yes, I agree with you. But what is most important part of the definition is that, that it is not only dilated, tortuous, subcutaneous vein, very important, more than 3 millimeter in diameter because the CEAP talks about this terminology. And with a demonstrable reflux means that there has to be a reversal of flow of blood. <clears throat> so if I ask you how do you define a varicose vein, please remember Dilated, tortuous, elongated, subcutaneous are the four words. The fourth word is a demonstrable reflux and this is the most important word that I am interested in. Because your diagnosis either clinically, which is done by what test? By usually a SWOT test or a Trendelenburg test is all based on this point only. Or if you use something called as a color Doppler, then remember a color Doppler or a handle Doppler is all responsible for this. So this is what is the basic story about a very close vein. Now, other conditions that can also lead to but are not understandable 
is something called as a primary varicose veins, where probably because of the prolonged standing, whereas the congenital varicose veins will mean that the problem is probably because that the arteries in questions had been in communication with this. So the arteries in question had been in communication with this. So this is all about white as a varicose vein form. Now due to this chronic venous hypertension, some people measure it and call it an ambulatory venous hypertension. Okay, so sorry, ambulatory venous hypertension. Now what is important is that, that it can be reflected in form of a pedal edema or it can later lead to a pigmentation which will then lead to a change called as a lipodermatosclerosis reflected by a champagne leg deformity and super added by something called as an eczema. As you know that these are all the changes that a group called as CEAP classification is something that needs to be understood in this point. So please remember when someone is asking you, Doc, tell me what are the complications of a varicose vein. Remember the first complication, the reason the patient has come to you is because of cosmesis. Now, due to a venous hypertension, which is which is either a etiology or a result of a varicose vein, remember that it will lead to a venous ulcer. A venous ulcer can lead to a bleeding or a cellulitis or a marjolin's ulcer. Now, venous ulcers, when they heal, can lead to deformity, which is an equinous deformity, and a gait abnormality because of the deformity. So, if someone asks you what are the complications of a varicose vein, please mind it, the first complication in concern is usually a cosmetic concern. The first complication is usually a cosmetic concern followed by all of these complications. Don't forget to mention bleed, cellulitis, and a margolin's ulcer. So these are all about points about what is a very good way. Now, when you talk about the history and you come to the case now, talking of the case, remember that in history, the points are very straight, not elaborate ones. You can talk about an occupation of the patient, Talk about the duration of the disease and the present issue. That means the occupation of the leg, this is the leg of a traffic constable. And if you are a surgeon, please look at your own legs. By this time, oh my God, you see that you have started having the repose veins. Now, the majority of the patients will present to you with a prominent vein. So don't say that patient had a very close vein. The patient had a prominent vein. And the prominent vein was associated with a skin change. The prominent vein is associated with a skin change and a ulcer. There will be a history of DVT if you are talking about a secondary varicose vein. So take a history of a secondary varicose vein. Smoking does not produce a varicose vein. So now there is a misconception, misinterpretation. But smoking delays the wound healing. Always remember that. Drugs or something like warfarin, if taken, will mean that the patient has a chronic venous disease. History of a previous varicose vein surgery suggests that the patient has a recurrent disease. Okay. So the examiner will be wanting you to comment upon these ones. The main problem can be all about this. In the arterial topic, we'll talk about this very quickly there is a term called as venous claudication and venous claudication means a bursting type of pain rather than a shooting type of pain in an arterial disease so it is a bursting type of pain now before you start the patient will always be standing bilateral exposure from normal and then the abnormal limb please for an MRCS examination remember if you are planning to have you must be knowing how to use and handle Doppler. This is the most important thing because in MRCS, tourniquets are something 
that uh, when 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 uh, are not very favored. So you must be very clear about how to use a handheld Doppler. Now, before we start, remember that this piece of clothing is called as a gaiter. Okay, and in a gaiter zone, the lower two third of the leg is thus called as a gaiter zone. So the gaiter zone is the lower two third and is called as a gaiter zone in the leg. Okay. The main point that varicose vein hyperpigmentation occurs because of the number one, the maximum thrust of the or the column of the blood attains the maximum pressure in this point because say for example this is a water manometer and that means definitely the water down here has the highest pressure rather than the water at this point point number two remember that that the number of perforators in this region are innumerous or numerous so much so that that all this hyperpigmentation ulcers etc they occur at maximum chance around this point Okay, so this talks about what is this problem. Now, before we start, as I have said, we should always go by something called inspection of the vascular system. It is not that I have inspected a varicose vein. Inspection of vascular, palpation of vascular. Don't please write percussion and auscultation. That makes it very stupid. Regional examination, joint movement, ulcer examination and abdomen examination so please write all the points or say all the points in this sequence definitely regional examination means you are required to see the artery and the vein whereas joint movements and ulcer examination along with abdomen now what are the points to describe in an inspection number one talk about the venous distribution in the great saphenous and the short saphenous territory i hope you know by this time what is the territory about the great saphenous and the short saphenous what is important in this territory story is that that remember that the great saphenous territory is in the medial aspect of the leg sorry the medial way sorry this one is on the medial aspect of the thigh so let me highlight this for you how where do you find the great saphenous system? So I find the great saphenous system on the medial aspect of the thigh. I find the great saphenous system on the posterior aspect of the knee. I find the great saphenous system on the posteromedial aspect of the leg. So the anatomy of the great saphenous vein is always asked. It is found as a continuation of the dorsal venous arch in front of the medial malleolus. Now it can be, so what are the points that I have said here? So let's recap. Great saphenous vein is from medial aspect of the leg, posterior, sorry, medial aspect of the thigh, posterior aspect of the knee, posterior medial aspect of the leg. Now, the saphenous nerve accompanies the vein below the knee and hence no stripping that is done. Whereas the short saphenous system Please remember, whereas the short saphenous system, whereas the short saphenous system, remember, talks about is present as a continuation of the dorsal venous arch behind the lateral malleolus, and remember, goes behind the lateral malleolus and lateral to the tendon of Rindo Achilles and joins into the short saphenous, sorry, the popliteal vein at a very variable termination. Important viva question. Either it is 15 centimeter below the crease of the knee or 2 centimeter above the crease of the knee. So, what does the short saphenous vein terminate? The short saphenous vein terminates either below or at or above the popliteal fossa into the popliteal vein. And mind it, it is either 15 or 12. And if the examiner asks, are you so sure about it? That means he is understanding or he is asking you about the role of a color doppler to have the final answer so please remember this point so this completes guys what is the anatomy story about this and what are the things that you have looked for as i've said tributaries and branches are things that you have said a blowout means i'll show you a picture is a 
localized site in which a perforator remember that a perforator is going to go to the deeper system but when it goes to the deeper system there has a gap due to the reflux that it has produced and this makes it a subcutaneous lump like a compressible lump which is thus a blowout people will ask you what is a stray varicosity or a isolated varicosity okay now pre varicose means presence of reticular veins is pre varicosity presence of scars due to an ulcer or an active ulcer are described and as you know that arterial so remember that all venous ulcers are seen on the medial aspect of the leg so venous ulcers are medial aspect so venous arterial ulcers always remember are in the tip of the digit or in the dorsum or in the lateral so an arterial ulcer is a black arrow so this is arterial this is venous a neuropathic ulcer is always on the pressure points like the heel the head of the first metatarsal and this point so this completes your description about this part now skin changes like lipodermatosclerosis is something that you have already completed is thus described so we have completed the first part now the next part is what are the tests that are done and what is the basis of doing this test on this chart guys is extremely important this table is extremely important because this is exactly what the viva is why did you do the trendelenburg test to show the cephalofemoral reflux now what is the other test that can show the cephalofemoral reflux is the modisys test whereas the multiple tourniquet is going to show you the perforators and give you an idea whereas the figans method can only be done when you have a blowout and what you have to do is that when the patient has its leg up you need to mark the site of blowout with an arrow and then tell the patient to stand down your marked area now has a swelling and when you palpate that area remember you get a button hole like defect so the perthes test is all about you understanding that the perforators and the blowouts will make a enlargement of the deep fascia which will be felt as a button hole defect a perthes and a modified perthes perthes used to nesh marks modified a tourniquet is to rule out a sequel of an acute dvt swartz's step test will show you that there is a reverse flow of blood in that now a quick video that i took from the internet is on uh, youtube is about so this is one of our Sorry. most famous golden cast yeah so at the set please reserve your questions for the end because we maximum out uh, 10 minutes maximum with the very close win now let us talk about the trendelenburg test trendelenburg test remember is to show the cepheno femoral incompetency the location of the sfj is 4 cm below and 4 cm lateral to the pubic tubercle you can put your thumb which some people say is a much better technique than tying a tourniquet much accurate than tying a tourniquet i really beg to differ because keeping your thumb on a fatty man particularly is really damn difficult probably tying a tourniquet is much easier but the basic intent is you allow the tourniquet or press the thumb and then stop by this time if you have seen that there are veins below the knee which are filling from below upwards probably that means the perforators are incompetent this is called as part 2 of the trendelenburg test which is made to suggest that the perforators which are incompetent whereas the part 1 of the test is now to release your thumb from the sfj and if there is a flow of blood above downwards above downwards above downwards means there is a reverse flow of blood above downwards now if there is an above downwards release like you saw in the video now 
if there is a release of blood above downwards from that is the groin to the knee that suggests that there is a deflux or an incompetent sfj so the test is recorded i will i have confusions in understanding positive and negative when in exam i say that sir on doing the tendelenburg test i found there was a deflux of the blood to the cephalosomal junction part 2 of the tendelenburg test was also done which suggested there may be perforated income because tendelenburg 2 is not an accurate one a multiple tourniquet test is done with one basic simple philosophy is that that if this is the superficial vein okay agree this is the superficial vein okay agree and this is the termination of the superficial vein absolutely right now let me mark the sites of perforators which could be cockets perforator near the ankle okay it could be uh, the may and the pustar the cocket the dot the void okay and the hunterian perforator now the problem is that nowadays we do not use the eponymous names we use numbers but the basic idea that you are required to know is that that these perforators are joining the deep vein so let us take the deep vein and mark it with a deep yellow color yes right now so this is the deep vein guys and what is connecting this system or what is connecting this system is a perforator now let us presume that the perforator in this is incompetent and there is a reflux of blood that goes back which will effectively and ultimately lead rise to the segment of the vein which will now not at all be like this but will always be dilated tortuous and elongated as you have seen that means but the rest of these perforators whatever they are they are normal so that means when you tie a multiple tourniquet test the basic idea is to isolate that segment of the vein and then to find out more accurately where is your perforator problem so seeing a quick video is always good and see this video and see this that in this multiple tourniquet test the basic idea is that the leg is elevated and when the leg is elevated please remember that that the leg is empty the first tourniquet or the tourniquet one is tied below the saphenous femoral junction the second tourniquet is the navabni tourniquet where the third tourniquet is below the or the at the level of the tibial tubercle so this is the tourniquet tourniquet one below the sfj that means above the tourniquet one will be the saphenous femoral valve tourniquet two is the adductor canal perforator tourniquet 3 is something that is below the bilony perforator so that is going to make you understand so this picture is extremely important to make you understand that you need three tourniquets to be tied in a multiple tourniquet test so unnecessarily don't hang around with around 20 tourniquets hanging from your apron pocket it looks like a bunch of noodles that is coming out believe me guys okay so this is all about you know whatever you are required to do is that just keep it tight let the patient do a tip toe and see which segment of the vein gets distended <laughs> if it does not then understand that there is no perforator problem so this is all about what is called as a perforator test now the next point is how to rule out a dvt is by doing something called as how to rule out a dvt is by doing something called as a modified parthis test the basic idea about a modified parthis test is that see this in this is that that whenever you do the modified parthis the logic is straight blood goes to the deep vein as we have seen if the deep vein is choked it will go through the superficial vein that means the effective way is that till the patient to walk now if your patient walked and then there was a prominence of the vein if your patient did walk and there was a prominence of the vein then please remember that that means that there is a block in the deep vein so this is a modified parthis we do not allow our patients to walk away we can really walk away from the hall so what we do is that we tell the patient to go for a uh, uh, we tell the patient to do for a tiptoe movement or an exercise so again i do not like positive or negative 
negative. So say that suddenly can modify birches. The patient did not have a bursting pain or did not have a prominent swelling of the vein. Complete. Let us now come to the way you will present. Now, at a postgraduate examination, you are required to know something called as a CEAP. This is a basic thing that a postgraduate DNB and an MS must know. If you are appearing for an MRCS, well, well, well. Uh, not that mandatory for you to know. I mean, MLE may be you are required to know, but DNB and MS, it is mandatory that you are required to know the CEAP. Now, some people call this uh, likely as the TNM of the varicose vein. So, if you are conversant with using these terms, please understand. This is daily love, and hence I hope you understand how important it is. Like, this is a picture that was given to me by my senior colleague. Uh, Professor Das, so and as you can see, beautiful picture where you can get to see a blowout. I hope, okay. Along with that, you can see the varicose vein. Along with that, you can get to see the ulcer. Along with that, you can see the lipodermatosclerosis. You can see that very well, along with a few eczematoid changes. So, this is a C6S, EPAS, and a PR. What does it mean? The 6 suggests that this is an active ulcer. The P suggests it is primary because he was a school teacher or a businessman. S is for superficial great saphenous system. R is for reflux to this one. Now you can also conventionally say that he is a 45 year old gentleman, shopkeeper by profession, very important words, with a symptomatic varicose vein. Now, some people are in the habit of saying, what is your diagnosis? Where it goes when? At an undergraduate exam is good, but at a postgraduate exam, I will beg to differ. And you are required to see involving which territory complicated by what and what is the etiology. The etiology here is probably a reflux from the SFJ and a belonging perforator. So either you can say this or you can say this one. I will prefer definitely a CEAP classification much better. Now, questions. What will you do next? Sir, I would like to complement my diagnosis by doing a handle Doppler. Now, if you have not seen a handle Doppler, now it is my turn to show you. But remember, a MRCS examination, this is a mandatory requirement for you to use a handle Doppler. You require to know how to complement your diagnosis. Complement means how shall you uh, make or achieve your diagnosis and to confirm your diagnosis clinically. So, Handel Doppler is a bedside tool. It is not a lab one. Then I will explain to the patient the need for a surgical intervention. If there is an ulcer like the picture I showed you, I will treat the ulcer and finally I will prepare the elective. Believe me guys, everyone talks about an operation. Examiners are not interested in an operation. They are more interested in you understanding the plan of the story. I hope the audio works. I do not know. Carefully standing. Okay. Look carefully. Is the audio. Veins, Hello. Veins, varicose veins. Yes. Other signs. Let me check the audio is coming a little bit. Okay. Feeble, but feeble. I know that. Are you okay. Doppler? Right, so this is the picture of the handheld Doppler. This is one. Okay. This it's just silent now. The midpoint of the angle of the and you can hear the pulsations of the femoral artery and as the probe is moved slowly immediately it will pick up the signals of the severe femoral junction and the great saphenous vein when the calf is squeezed an augmentation signal is heard indicating forward flow up the vein towards the heart when the calf is released any reflux is detected by another auditory signal in the popliteal region, the neurovascular bundle is aligned in a sagittal plane. So when insulating... Okay, right. I hope uh, you all heard. It was audible? Yes, it was audible. Yes, good. So I hope that you have heard those sounds of reflux. Because yes, it is good to have an idea about how exactly does this reflux thing... Because rather than having it wholly theoretical, and hence I took this YouTube video to make you understand. So this is all about what you will say. Now, after that, the examiner asks, so then what? Sir, I will like to confirm the disease condition. You have already done the handle Doppler. 
But now to rule out a deep vein thrombosis, it is good to do something called as a color Doppler B mode ultrasound, which is going to show you the lumen of the deep vein, the flow direction, and the examiner's favorite question sometimes is something called as the Mickey Mouse. In the face of the Mickey is the common femoral vein. If this is the great saphenous vein and this is the femoral artery always see that the common femoral vein is the face of the mickey now due to the reflux if one of these becomes increased this is a mickey mouse problem or a mickey mouse sign you also get the mickey mouse sign in obstructive jaundice mind you other investigations can include an ultrasound of the abdomen to find a abdominal lump now what is the treatment the treatment first is Keep back questions. Questions. Uh, please keep your questions sir, and then just will take a minute and then we'll discuss and then go to artery disease. So symptoms are treated with pain, edema and a graded compression stocking. Now the graded compression stocking that we use is usually a grade 2 by the British standards and gives a pressure of about 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury. Okay at the end. Okay. <laughs> The ulcers are treated conservatively by a regime called as Biscard's regime. The main component is elevation or bed rest with leg elevation. The dressing is called as a Charing Cross method, many opponents by four layers. And my preference is always surgery after an ulcer heals because there is a trial called as the Ishkar 2 daily love stock again, where after the ulcer heals, we go for the surgery. What surgery? Surgery in this time and this era depends upon which hospital you have worked on. Either you can have an open conventional surgery, which you can see in an exam, sir, that this is something that I have assisted, or you can do an endovenous treatment, which has come to be the so-called gold standard. But countries like India, it has then been a very costly affair. But those who have had that say that, yes, it is a good one. Now, you are asked about the main idea about this one is that, that you go for a flush ligation of the SFJ and the tributaries with an above knee stripping and a below knee subfascial perforator ligation. Now, this operation is commonly called as a Trendelenburg operation. And so you have a Trendelenburg test, you have a Trendelenburg operation, you have a Trendelenburg position. Trendelenburg was a German surgeon. He had a very strong liking for India. And so please remember that uh, he had a first ligation of a saponophobal junction, the tributaries, and with a below knee subpartial ligation. Okay, right. Now, what is important is that, that before you proceed for a surgery or a radio frequency ablation or a nebula, always rule out that the deep vents are patent always rule out that there is no coexistent arterial problems and that there is nothing of that bad in the abdomen. So this is all that is important about this point. So guys, this talks about, we will not talk about endovenous treatment, time is short. So this completes your treatment or discussion about the varicose vein. Okay, so please, your questions now. Hello? Yes, please ask your questions now. Sorry, you know, uh, make you make a mouse sign uh, yeah. when we look for GSV uh, in, uh, under USG. Sir, so, uh, uh, we, uh, we look for just from in on lying down position to, to check for yeah. left legs. Now, see, very, very good question. Extremely good question, sir. Number one is that, that as you have very rightly said, that all venous dopplers are done in a standing position because if you allow that thing to lie or if you allow that enlarged or refluxed uh, great saphenous vein, it will definitely collapse when the patient will lie down. So, ideally it should be done when the patient is standing up to do the top line. Okay. Next one, please. Any more questions on venous disease? Hello? Any more questions on venous disease? No questions? Oh, someone has asked. Okay, let me see the chat then. Let me stop the broadcast for a second. Let me see the chat. Someone has asked something. 
what does flush ligation mean? Flush ligation means that you have it, you are just close to the femoral vein. You have just flushed away the cut between the femoral vein and the great saphenous vein. So that is a conventional English way of saying that you have uprooted that one. So that is a conventional way of saying. Sir, yeah. So how would you proceed if you if you detected concomitant DVT? During the How will I proceed if I detect a compost DVT? Number one is that definitely DVT means a chronic DVT because the varicose vein had formed because of a chronic venous hypertension. Sir, I will definitely uh, take a the first answer that I will say in an exam is that, sir, I will continue with the medications that the patient like an oral, like an warfarin or other oral anticoagulants. Number two, I will see the length of the occlusion. Number three, I will always think of a vascular surgery referral for a potential repair of the damaged valves of the deep venous system. This is what, as a MS or a DNB candidate, sir, I will answer for an examination. But I will not do any form of a surgical intervention for this patient. Should I use a stocking in a patient with a DVD? you understand my question? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Again, sir, no yes, is sir. Not right exactly. Remember that stocking is known to decrease edema. Stocking is known to assist in killing of a venous ulcer. Okay, so and becomes easy for the patient to do his or her daily job. Now, but definitely if you use a too tight a stocking, the problem is that the only circulated you is choked. So you can use a stocking, but the grade of compression has to be lower, like a grade one compression stocking, and that also a below knee compression stocking. Okay, someone of you asked about what is the role of, uh, sorry, what is the role of venotonics? So I get to role of drug treatment like venotonics are usually for a CAP, a clinical grade one. Remember when there is an early varicose veins, they are known to produce a stability of the venous wall. But that does not have a strong evidence to be used when there is a clinically apparent varicose vein. Surgery is always the best option. What is duplex in a Doppler ultrasound scanning? So we are going to come uh, in that just in a minute when you talk about an arterial system. What is the meaning of a four-layer dressing? The first layer is a jalonet or, oh, sorry for using trade names, is a paraffin gauge. The next layer, remember, is an absorbent uh, is an absorbent gauge which can contain some antibiotic ointment. The third layer is an absorbent cotton. The fourth layer is a stretchable bandage like a crepe bandage. So the first layer is sofratuli or your gelonate or your paraffin gauge. The next one is a gauge which absorbs the secretions. Third one is a cotton. Fourth one is a crepe bandage. Okay, uh, right. Some people have added the stocking to be the fifth one. So this is all about the four layer dressings, right? So I think that we have finished our varicose veins. Uh, no more questions, I hope. I think. So let us start with the arterial yeah, system. Now. Need, uh, hmm. Yes. For below the varicose veins, your question is an incomplete. No, see, again, the, sir, the story is very simple. I told you, all of them are going to go through a handheld Doppler. That shows you which perforators are problem. Now, a baloney varicose vein doesn't mean that your SFG is not incompetent. So, you have to rule out whether there is an SFG incompetence. Now, the management cell will remain always the same. You need to confirm what is your diagnosis, which are the perforators that are incompetent, and after you have diagnosed that part, then your next job is to tackle those perforators as well as the trunk of the varicose vein. Now, whenever you do a stripping, remember, you are going to take the trunk of the vein. Whenever you do an RFA or a EVLA, you can do both the trunk and the tributary, which will be burned from inside or coagulated from inside so that blood does not get to travel across that part. Okay? So this is all about things. Okay. Any more queries now? No more queries? Thank you. Right. 
so we have completed this part. Guys, just uh, wait. Let me take out the arterial disease class. All right. Now, when I start with an arterial disease problem, I always uh, and definitely we will talk about uh, diabetic foot. Arterial disease problems, as I always say, is about more water or less water. More water and less water. Now, when I talk about more and less water, remember that a more water or more blood is going to lead to a hypertrophy. Hematomatous lesions are usually associated with a regional hypertrophy because of increased arteriovenous communications. Okay, like an arteriovenous fistula. So, if an arteriovenous fistula happens, it is associated with a localized limb hypertrophy. Less blood is going to produce, again, a grade of changes that includes, remember, a state of definitions which will start with you getting asked about what is an ischemia yeah, you are getting asked about what is an ischemia. That means is a reversible state of having a tissue or a cell with a decreased blood supply. So you are in this part, in this part of your viva, at any part in an arterial disease. So we change, we have changed gears, moved on from vein, and we talk about arterial disease. We talk about ischemia. Ischemia is a reversible. Infarction is not reversible, like say for example myocardial infarction. But both of them understand that is still at the cellular level, with infarction being at the tissue level. Now, when the tissue is infarcted, either you land up with a necrosis, which is a macroscopic change, or a necrosis with a superadded putrefaction, is called as a gangrene. So it is a superadded putrefaction that leads to a gangrene. There is an interesting state called as a state of pre-gangrene where people use the word called as there is an impending necrosis but with a blood flow. So remember that a pre-gangrene is a state that is something that you need to understand. So from venous disease, as I have said, we have changed the gears and let us talk about an arterial disease. So let us talk about an arterial disease. Now when I have talked about an arterial disease, remember that when I have talked about an arterial disease, as I have said, a state of a pre-gangrene, now a state of a pre-gangrene, remember, is a state of a compromised circulation is a state of a compromised circulation. And in this state of compromised circulation, what is understandable is that there are states of imminent gangrene. So if I ask you how will you define a pre-gangrene, a state of compromised circulation with an imminent gangrene to the tissue associated still with a less than normal blood flow. Now remember a necrosis and a gangrene will not, not have any blood flow, will have no circulation, but in this one as you can see there is a blood flow. So this is something called the state of pre-gangrene. So this is an imminent gangrene with less than normal amount of flow of blood. Okay, so this completes the story. Now a pre-gangrene, remember, is going to proceed to a gangrene. Okay, right, so pre-gangrene proceeds on to develop a gangrene. Uh, so now, so if you have understood up till this point, limb ischemias can be either in form of an acute limb ischemia or in form of a chronic limb ischemia. The rest of the discussion before we jump on to chronic, let us talk about an acute limb ischemia. Now remember that an acute limb ischemia talks about to ask and to see. Now, an acute limb ischemia is either one of these three conditions. Either there is a embolus or there is a thrombosis or there is a trauma. So why does an acute limb ischemia happen? 
embolus it, i call it tet thrombosis embolism and a trauma now due to the acute limb ischemia the patient will have remember the first thing that appears is the patient complains of pain pain is followed by the second change is something called as a pallor when you have seen the patient this is change number 3 is a pulselessness then follows paresthesia which is a sensory innervation which gets lost followed by the motor problems of paralysis and ultimately a cold limb which is poikilothermia if i ask you what are the six p's of an acute limb ischemia then the first p is pain pulselessness pallor paresthesia paralysis poikilothermia and in this order examiners will like to ask you the order of their appearance what is important is that that till the time you have pallor the limb can be salvaged if coming within 4 hours if the limb has a paresthesia and is within 6 hours it is still considered salvageable but if it is beyond 4 to 6 hours or there is an onset of paralysis or a poikilothermia that limb is not salvageable mind you that limb is not salvageable and it will even do a reperfusion or a revascularization you are likely to land up with a reperfusion injury now remember that examiner's favorite question what is the cause why are you so worried about a reperfusion injury okay can anyone in the group tell me why are you so worried about a reperfusion injury that means if the femoral artery was blocked and suddenly after 6 hours you opened the femoral artery so why are you so worried why are you worried about this one because the shock and ards it causes shock and ards will be still it will take time no the destroyed me and due to the cells the cells contain lots of calcium and lactic acid now when that goes in the circulation so like this one okay it is going to produce a massive cardiac arrest so this is all about the danger about a knee perfusion injury okay right <clears throat> now the other side of the story is something that we talk about is called as a chronic limb ischemia <clears throat> now when you talk about a chronic limb ischemia <clears throat> a chronic limb ischemia is always a very slow process and in this slow process there is a gradual narrowing of the artery So in a chronic limb ischemia, the basic idea is that that there is a gradual narrowing in the lumen of the artery. The artery lumen gets gradually choked. Now in this chronic limb ischemia, this is the gradual narrowing. That obviously will mean that the patient is going to have a history of a claudication or a specific type of pain that occurs very with a slow onset. The grade of the severity will vary because more is the block, more is it severe. And at the end of the day, when it is absolutely chock a block, you will end up with a rest pain. Along with that, when there is a decreased blood flow, definitely, obviously, we mean there will be changes in the skin, effectively leading on to an ulcer, which may end up with an amputation. Then we need to talk about addictions like cigarette smoking, which is to be quantified in a pack year index. So either it is now, so you are required to quantify this one. in form of a smoking index or a pack year index remember that pack year index was initially formulated for lung malignancies later people understood that cigarette is also responsible for producing other diseases they translated it that into this risk factors apart from this will include diabetes and hyperlipidemia other drugs of concern that the patient may be taking can include drugs like aspirin to make his life much easier remember that when there is an artery block in the limb simultaneously there are other areas which are 
Now, simultaneously, other areas of the body like the heart, the brain, the kidney, the genitals. Now, for this one, say for example, if there is a decreased blood supply in the heart, will it be angina pectoris, kidney, hypertension, brain, TIA. But in the genitals, the examiners will love to ask you this question is what is Lerich's syndrome? Now, Lerich's syndrome means that if you consider the bifurcation of the iliac artery and if this is the bifurcation of the iliac along with the trunk, what is important is that this is the lumen of the artery. This is the lumen of the artery which is blocked by an atheroma. However, if both the lumens of internal iliac artery are blocked, that is going to lead around to a form of an erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction or an ED. This is called as a chronic limb tissue. So this is called as very sorry, a Lerich's syndrome. So Lerich's syndrome is a form of an erectile dysfunction. People call it as a type 3 autoiliac block where the clot or sorry, the thrombus blocks this point. So it's an important viva question. Now, when I talk about claudication, the word Claudius comes from the Roman Emperor Claudius. So understand that. So uh, he was known to have a limp and probably that saved his life. The grades of the claudication, the claudication is a story that starts with a block in the artery. So uh, like the Neymar scale, okay? So uh, on this one, so let us talk about the claudication scale. Now, if you talk about the claudication scale, uh, what I really find it important is that in your exams, examiners will ask you about something called as a Boyd's classification claudication. So it is a Boyd's classification of an intermittent claudication means that a boy one the pain disappears and the patient continues to walk a boy two the pain continues with the patient and a boy three the patient is compelled to take a rest pain or oh, sorry to take a pain or to take a relief from the pain whereas at grade four is a rest pain however for a postgraduate student it is expected that you should know what is a Fontaine and what is a Rutherford's classification? So these are important, particularly for your DNB viva and in your future exams as well. So remember that. So this is the Rutherford's classification and the Fontaine's classification. Now, whenever you talk about examination, examinations are to talk about as a general survey, examination of the vascular system of extremities, general or a systemic examination. Now, the general circuit, the important point apart from seeing BMI, blood pressure, pallor, cyanosis, is something called as it. Pain is seen, as you can see into his face, he has a very anxious face, he is very worried about his pain, he should be. And please see the position of the patient, I took it from one of the textbooks of surgery, of practical subsurgery, and some people call it as a hen holding position. So, but the patient is sitting upright, screaming in pain. Now, examination of the vascular system. Now, so well, uh, you can go with this flow, you can re reorganize your thoughts. But what I felt was that, that whenever we go through this way, either you end up with having an inspection, a palpation, don't be on parkasha, you can do an auscultation. But what I find is that, Temperature, tenderness, limb girth, foot, gangrene, capillary fill, refill, special test, footprint, and an amputation, stump. In the upper limb also, you have a special test like an Allen's test, capillary refill, and a venous fill. Now, before you start the examination like this gentleman, he had a puffy face due to a renal failure. The patient was a diabetic, as you can see in the picture. You could see the insulin syringe, you could see the insulin, you could see the glucose drink to prevent hypoglycemia, and the patient has a puffy face. Always remember that the exposure should cover the genitalia. This is a bird's eye view about how I like the exposure from the abdomen. Please remember, I need to expose the abdomen and then I will go to the foot because the blood 
always close a pattern like this as you can see the arterial system is exactly orange like this so this is the aorta this is the common femoral superficial femoral and then popliteal popliteal doesn't have two branches it has three branches called the bifurcation so remember that one that this is all about what is the position on inspection both the hands and the legs always talk about by comparison abnormal and the normal side always abnormal normal abnormal normal that means whenever you are comparing the thigh normal abnormal ab leg normal abnormal foot normal abnormal what are the things that you would like to see both on inspection and the palpation so i like to see the girth of the limb which suggests that there is a decrease I like to see the muscle power by the MRC grade. I like to see the changes in this, like as you can see very clearly, there are black color discoloration. I like to see the subcutaneous tissue changes. Okay, that has occurred because the patient has shriveled up. Okay, this area, so I need to see the changes. And if there are ulcers, I need to see for them also, like in this one. You should now go for the foot and the hand examination. The first thing that I am concerned about is about how many digits does the patient have. Important idea, guys. There can be, as you can see, as I told you, sir, the normal limb was said to be this one. So this is the normal limb and this is the normal limb. Is it really normal? No, absolutely not. As you can see, there is a loss of a digit. There are some ischemia in this. So also comment upon, remember, also at this point, do comment upon the digit, the ulcer, the nail, the joint movements and deformity, neurological examination, and finally, the gangrene. Now, when you talk about a gangrene, a gangrene could have been a dry gangrene with a clear-cut line of demarcation. Yeah, it could have been a wet gangrene with, with these points, and there is a point of cletitis in the tissue which suggests previously called as gas gangrene. So this is a form of a wet gangrene. And remember that, so a wet gangrene does not have a line of demarcation to a made. Wet gangrene sometimes are painful and are usually a source of a sepsis. If it is untreated, dry gangrene is much better than that. But you are required to comment how many fingers have a gangrene, what are the changes of this? Okay, right. So that crepness is palpitatory or auscultatory. It is palpitatory, sir. Crepitus is always a palpitatory finding. Auscultation is called the auscultate for the crepitus. In an arterial system, you auscultate for a turbulence in form of a brain. Now come to an ulcer. An ulcer, remember, like all ulcers that we have started describing the whole day, surrounding. So, what is the surrounding change that you can see? You can see a shiny skin, loss of hair. Loss of subcutaneous that's suggestive of what? A chronic arterial insufficiency. Now talk about the margin. But margin, as you can see in this one, is a well-defined margin. Now talk about the floor which contains now. Now talk about yes, looks like an palpated. Now what is important? All green as I have said, the definition that it is a state of an imminent so the blood supply is not that great. But still it can be recorded, but still it can be filled, but the tissues are undergoing a form of a necrosis or gangrene. So this is a state of imminent necrosis, so something called as pre -gangrene. Now come to the palpation of the artery, that you know what an artery is to be palpated. Always write like this, if you are given a copy, that makes it much more logical. Please don't uh, make unnecessary findings like plus, 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 and now, now, now plus, plus. Both of them could mean the same. Unnecessarily, as I have told, do not use legends. Use legends with this understanding or nomenclature only. Now, how to palpate the artery? 
So the first start is you know if you are given an empirical method, this becomes an important issue. The arterial dorsal stenosis is one among the most frequently asked questions in exam. So this is an extremely important. These are my hands, and as you can see, the basic idea is that that the left hand is doing the left hand is resisting the extension. So this is the left hand, whereas the right hand. Is palpating below the intermalleolar line on which bone the cuneiform, the talus, the base of the first metatarsal, not the navicular. So it is the intermediate cuneiform, the talus, and the base of the first metatarsal. So please remember that. Do not go into much more anteriorly because the artery is ending here. So if you had palpated the artery at this point. That is a absent artery. So please remember that that your palpation has to be limited on the bone. So understand that point. An anterior tibial artery is a mirror image, except that you place your finger above the level of the medial malleolus. Okay, right. Now come to posterior tibial artery. The leg now, as you can see in this picture, the leg now is externally rotated. As you can see in the picture, the leg now is externally rotated. If it is externally rotated, the important point is that now with your left hand, you are keeping it rotated. Find the tip of the medial malleolus and the tip of the calcaneum. Join it, and you will find it over the tibia. Now there is a confusion about is it palpated on the calcaneus? I feel that no. It is much better to talk about. The posterior aspect of the medial malleolus over which it is felt. So I hope you will appreciate by this point that all arteries and all, all nodes in the body are usually felt against a tough structure. Arteries against a bone. Arteries against a bone. When you talk about the peroneal artery, the leg is internally rotated, and you feel with the left hand. So this is the peroneal artery, and as I said, the posterior artery trifurcates. Anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and the peroneal. We will add that no, the peroneal is a branch of posterior tibial. No, sir. In an angiogram and in a clinical practice, sir, that is different. Popliteal artery. This is the classical technique. Patient lies supine. You wrap your hands around the trunk of the gastrocnemius and palpate against the tibial condyle, which is a very, very, very difficult procedure to do. Normal peripheral artery is well is seldom palpable. Please remember that. Now, the next test for a peripheral artery out of the three. So, slide of anterior. What is the slide of anterior? No, 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 sir.